Hi everybody, welcome to um, our July Mars Oxide webinar or the first of two July Mars Oxide webinars. Um, my name is Emma McKinley and I am a research fellow based at Cardiff University and the chair of the Marine Social Science Network. And today we have Ben McAteer who's a PhD student from Queen's University in Belfast to talk to us about his research on community science and its role in delivering marine conservation objectives. Before I hand over to Ben, I um, just want to kind of remind people about the, the network. Um, if you're interested knowing more about Mars Oxai, you can check out all of our previous webinars on our YouTube channel but also on our webpage um, so um, marsoxai.net um, and if you're interested in tweeting or posting along with today's session just please make sure you tag us as at Mars Oxai and you can use our hashtags I'll pop them in the chat in a second um, just a reminder that the session is being recorded and it's been set up as a webinar so you are all automatically muted and your cameras are off but when we get to the Q&A session after Ben has spoken and um, if you want to come on and um, on and uh, switch your camera on or ask your question through your microphone just let us know in the chat and I can do that for you it makes it a little bit more interactive for everybody and um, please pop your questions in the Q&A box as much as possible but I'll keep an eye on both the Q&A box and the chat function as well just to make sure we don't miss anything um, I think that is everything. So um, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Ben, who, as I said, is going to talk to us about his PhD research, um, which is talking all about community science and the role of volunteering and the role of, of that within the delivery of marine conservation outcomes. So Ben, I'll hand over to you. I can see your slides and I can hear you. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Emma. Um, and thanks for everyone for attending today as well. Um, I hope you can see the presentation OK. Yeah. Yeah, you're all good. Okay. So yeah, as Emma said, my name is Ben Agatir, um, and I'm a PhD student in the planning department at Queen's University Belfast. Um, and today in this presentation, I'll be talking about a recent publication um, that was published in Marine Policy that looks into community science and marine community science projects um, that I co-authored with my two supervisors, Dr. Wesley Flannery and Professor Brenda Murta. Um, and in the presentation, I'll give a, a brief overview of the kind of argument of, of the study. Um, and a background to what community science is um, and why it's been increasingly viewed as a useful tool for marine governance processes. Um, I'll go into the research design and the findings that we pulled out of the, of the study in the paper um, and then I'll finish up with a discussion on some of the key points that we pulled out um, that might lead to some topics of discussion in, in this webinar as well um, that we can continue into the, the end of the session and I'll finish with some conclusions as well I should say on recommendations that we pulled out of the paper um, both for theory and for practice um, in regards to the field of community science. Um, so like I mentioned, yeah, this, is, this presentation will be taken from a paper that's been recently published um, at the start of the year. Um, as I mentioned, it was co-authored with my two supervisors, Wesley Flannery and Brendan Murta. Um, and I just mentioned to Emma before the session started here that I thought it would be useful to mention that I also turned the, the paper into a blog for the Mars Oxai website, um, which I found was a really useful means of trying to decode what the paper meant from an academic um, background to then thinking about how I can make it more of a, an open or more accessible piece of research. Um, so I thought it was a really useful means of doing that. Uh, I certainly encourage any other um, people listening today that have papers that works or have just published something um, to think about how they could turn it into a blog and submit it to the website. Um, certainly, I, I took a lot of learning lessons from it of how I can translate and communicate um, research findings to a broader audience rather than just a uh, academic audience. Um, so yeah, def definitely recommend that as a potential uh, means of going forward. So um, just before I start the presentation, I should mention as well that in this paper, we've um, defined the participatory research approach that we're looking into as community science. Um, and it can be defined as a number of different um, approaches to community and participatory research, quite often citizen science. Um, but in this paper, we decided to go with community science. Um, and that was really just um, trying to, to lean in or uh, attach to current uh, commentary. Um, that was mentioned by citizen science might actually be quite an exclusionary term um, in the sense that you don't necessarily have to be a citizen to take part in projects. Um, and for that sense, perhaps something like community science is a more inclusive term um, that highlights how it's all members of communities who, who can get involved in these projects. Uh, but we're in no way critical of the term citizen science um, or suggesting that it should be used at all. Um, but just in this paper, we decided to go with community science. And perhaps this is something we can talk about again in the Q&A at the end of the session, um, because I'm sure there's a lot of viewpoints on what participatory research projects should be termed as and defined as. Um, 
like I mentioned, we use community science, but there's many other terms. Um, so it could be useful to mention that at the end, see what people's viewpoints are around that. So in terms of a background to the study, um, community science, um, or whatever terminology people like to use it by, is really a participatory means of research, um, which members of the public get involved with science, um, and scientific projects outside of an industrial or academic environment. Um, our low um, community science projects can be involved in many different realms, um, from ecology and astrology to public health. In this paper, we focus upon projects that focus on marine conservation. Um, and I'll go into a bit more detail on the exact projects that we looked into um, and how they work on marine conservation issues. Uh, but that was the general kind of field um, of community science projects that we looked into. Um, and in community science projects, volunteers who take part in the projects can take part in a whole different range of tasks. Um, so they can begin at the data collection level where they collect data um, for the means of the project, or they can be involved with analytical processes um, or dissemination of data and knowledge, as well as actually designing the projects as well. And generally, according to, to literature, um, community science and other types of participatory research are usually broken down into three different types of projects. Um, so in the contrib contributory level, um, this is where volunteers only really participate in the data collection tasks. Um, so their, their main kind of means of engagement is just contributory. Um, so they contribute the knowledge that they collect. Um, they can be more engaged, more active forms of participation as well. So there's collaborative projects. Um, and these are projects where volunteers take part in data collection, but they might also take part in analysis tasks as well. Um, and have a closer working relationship with the scientists and the coordinators of the projects. And then the most active form of participation in community science is co-produced projects. So these are projects where volunteers kind of have an equal footing um, with the scientists and coordinators of the projects um, in the sense that they take part in multiple different tasks, um, not just data collection, um, but right up to the design of projects as well. And in the paper, I don't think I mentioned too much in this presentation, but in the paper, I talk about the different levels of engagement and the different types of projects um, that we looked into, because uh, it's useful to link back to this when we look at the findings of the paper. Um, to think about what different volunteers or who different volunteers take part in projects and how these projects can differ. Um, so some interesting links between the volunteers themselves and the types of projects they take part in. Um, so like I mentioned, that's a bit more detail on that in the, the paper itself. And generally there's kind of three key outcomes um, or outputs of community science projects. One, um, in the instance of generating knowledge or producing knowledge. Um, so of course, like I mentioned, volunteers take part at the contributory level on onwards onwards in generating and collecting data. Um, so that's kind of one of the key outputs of projects is that they can create knowledge that can be used to inform conservation management approaches um, or could be linked up to policy as well, um, or just individual practices and reports um, on how marine conservation can go forward and develop. The second kind of outcome um, links to the volunteers themselves, so creating learning out outcomes and opportunities within volunteers. Um, so by taking part in these projects, not only do volunteers um, get experience of uh, conducting scientific research, um, engaging with others, but they can also develop personal um, and social learning outcomes as well. Um, so they can learn a bit more about scientific research, they can become more familiar with environmental processes, um, particularly in their local communities and local areas, um, and they can also become more literate on marine issues um, and develop more stewardship as well in terms of how they conduct themselves um, in relation to the environment and how also they encourage others to become more active um, and how you can um, look after and conserve the environment as well. And the final kind of output links to more civic engagement, um, a bit like the learning opportunities, um, by taking part in projects, there's some evidence in literature that can actually lead to changes in how uh, individual volunteers in the projects then engage with civic opportunities outside of projects. So they may become more um, active in their engagement with political um, institutions and opportunities to respond to policy. Um, and as well as taking part in more projects outside of those which they initially engaged with. Um, so become more active as a result of taking part in the projects. And these kind of three outputs um, have led to more literature suggesting that community science, as well as other types of participatory research can actually lead to a higher level of involvement um, of members of, the, of these projects um, in important political issues. Um, and how in turn, this could be seen as involving volunteers to create um, higher levels of democracy building as well. Um, so they can they can uh, take part in these projects actually actively integrate better society, um, and particularly obviously in these cases looking into how they can create more environmentally um, active groups of of uh, community science that can really look into conserving the marine environment in a more sustainable manner.
and community science has a real link uh, because of these three outputs um, to policy measures as well and the policy level um, and governance processes. First of all, in the sense that they obviously create and generate a lot of useful information. Um, an approach that we look into, obviously, they look into creating um, projects that can monitor marine conservation or marine environments um, and collect a lot of important recordings on ecosystems and habitats um, and species as well. So this is useful information that can be used in policy, and particularly as there's a real critical need to uh, create more data on environmental changes. Um, this is a key means of community science being able to link up with the policy arena. Second kind of link that uh, community science can have to policy links to the idea that there's a, a increasing um, amount of cuts being made to governance uh, scientific projects. Um, and added to this as well, there's an increasingly limited scope and frequency to the, the scientific projects that government departments are um, facilitating and funding. Um, so in that sense, um, community science can be seen as a good um, solution or alternative um, to ensuring that monitoring projects and recording projects can be uh, carried on a more frequent basis um, and can also obviously involve a greater number of individuals rather than just focusing on professional scientists funded by the government departments. By these community science projects, which have a large array of, of number of volunteers, um, can take part in projects that can link up the policy um, and really, like I mentioned, act as a solution to the increasingly common nature um, of funding cuts taking part to government research. And finally, the the issue as well of getting more members of the public just involved with governance processes. So like I said, taking part in projects has been documented as a means of enhancing the civic participation of volunteers. Um, and because engagement and participation is such a key aspect um, of what governance processes, um, particularly looking into marine planning and policy, um, how there's such a key emphasis placed upon participation of members of the public and groups of the public, um, certainly community science could be seen as a useful means of responding to those issues and those calls, um, ensuring that there is a greater participation by members of the public uh, and local marine communities in policy processes. And focusing particularly upon uh, marine governance issues, um, in this paper we really highlighted how there's two key issues that we think community science could respond to. Um, first of all, in the marginalization of stakeholders um, and local marine communities. So like I just mentioned, there's a real push to get more um, engagement from members of the public in policy processes um, and to ensure there's a high level of participation and ensuring the volunteers and members of the public can inform policy issues. Um, and certainly, like we mentioned, community science could be a useful means of doing that. And the second key issue um, in regards to current marine governance processes um, that we think community science could be a solution to in regards to the rationalization of knowledge. Um, so a lot of literature in recent years, uh, particularly since its critical turn in marine governance research came out, um, highlights how knowledge is, is um, not necessarily fully inclusive in marine governance processes. Um, so this kind of idea of rationalization of knowledge um, indicates or suggests that there's a, a focus upon specific types of knowledge, um, knowledge that comes from specific um, or specific, specific types of knowledge um, that can inform policy, um, but not necessarily allows for a wider range of knowledge, such as local knowledge um, and community insight um, to get to the policy level. Um, and knowledge that might be used to suit particular ends or particular predetermined um, issues that policy wants to respond to. So. We kind of put sit community science forward as a means of maybe challenging this, um, making sure that local knowledge can be transferred and transformed to the policy arena um, and make sure it has a better opportunity to access the policy systems. So kind of learning from this literature review, we then looked into how to really understand community science, you have to kind of uncode or decode the participation processes. So if community science is really to fulfill this potential um, as being a valuable tool for marine governance processes, um, projects themselves really have to acknowledge um, and cater for the volunteers' needs and motivations. Um, and this, is, this is something that's been looked into a lot in literature. Um, so it's not only important to look at the organizational side of projects, but also to look at the participation side as well. So to really understand what it is that encourages or motivates people to take part in projects. Um, and then to understand how we can, how projects can respond to these needs and requirements um, to make sure the volunteers can be in the best position to maximize their contribution. Um, so like I mentioned, yes, it's important that projects can tailor their participation processes to make sure there's a greater chance of volunteers will continue to participate, um, so to increase or encourage higher retention rates. Um, and also that, like I mentioned, that um, volunteers can really maximize their potential contribution um, and to make sure their expectations and what they want to achieve can actually be met. Um, and in a practical sense, um, higher levels of retention can lead to volunteers then being able to take part in a greater array of, array of tasks in the future. Um, so the more engaged and embedded they become within projects, they then become more comfortable and more confident as well 
um, take part in different projects and to really advance their, their participation um, to the different levels of community science. Um, and how not just this can be beneficial for volunteers, but also how it can be beneficial for the projects themselves um, in the sense that it can lead to better outcomes from the projects. So tr traditionally, um, to understand participation in any type of volunteer work really, um, but particularly in community science, research has looked into two key aspects. So first of all, motivations and secondly, the outcomes. Um, so these are of the volunteers themselves. So on the motivation side, um, in this paper, we looked at the, the framework created by Batson et al. in 2002, um, which wasn't focused on community science, um, it was more just in the general uh, field of volunteerism, um, but how they create four different themes or, or drivers really um, of different motivations that volunteers often fall, uh, fall into. So these can range from egoism, um, so these are really personal desires and goals to take part in a particular project that may be beneficial to themselves on a personal level. Uh, altruism, which is kind of the opposite, it's more outward looking, um, so how they can either motivate it by desire to actually help others. Um, and then in the case of community science, this can be to, to help the local environment or to help policy decisions um, or any way of actually outwardly impacting, um, creating beneficial outcomes that can support marine conservation. The third um, theme of motivations that they look into is collectivism. Um, so these are really collective ideas of how individuals might be motivated to support a, a group that they're a part of. And the final one looks to principalism. Um, so there's kind of more pr principles, or the environmental principles as well, that volunteers have um, that really drive them to take part in projects. So um, as I'll talk about a little bit in the findings, we find a lot of volunteers have principles linked to environmental matters that really push them to take part in projects. Um, because they thought it gives a bit more action to their the principles that they do have. Um, and they realize that becoming um, engaged with volunteer projects like community science, they can really add a bit more impact to their principles and really make sure they're responding to their own principles. And, and like I mentioned, the second output, traditionally um, the volunteer or that research is looked into to understand participation links to the outcomes of volunteers. So like I mentioned at the start, community science can really lead to beneficially impacting the volunteers who take part in projects. Um, so it's important to really look into these and decode them in a bit more detail. Um, so when we reviewed the literature for this paper, we pulled out a whole range of different types um, of outcomes that volunteers develop by taking part in projects, uh, be they in practical outcomes or more psychological outcomes as well. Um, so a lot of uh, literature talks about how community science and taking part in these projects can lead to educational development of volunteers. They become more knowledgeable um, of scientific process, environmental matters, um, and how it can also improve their social capital, um, as well as community engagement, their stewardship, um, as well as their ability to really change their approach to taking part in environmental projects as well. Um, so like the motivations talked about principalism, a lot of the outcomes as well linked to those kind of ideas. Um, so how volunteers maybe feel differently now about certain aspects, um, and they feel content um, and satisfied, satisfied with their own actions in the sense that they've given more of an active output to their time um, by taking part in community science projects. So although these are the kind of traditional approaches to understanding and measuring participation, we find that a lot of projects or a lot of literature don't necessarily link motivations to outcomes. Um, and that relationship between the two key, two, two, um, key means of understanding participation aren't necessarily linked to each other. Um, and we usually find the motivations and outcomes are implicitly related in the sense that they're in interdependent concepts that really require a much deeper analysis. Um, and we talk about in the paper, it's really important to view these as a, being part of a more complex set of attitudes, opinions, and behaviors. Um, so they shouldn't necessarily just be examined on their own. Um, so like I mentioned, a lot of papers just look, look into the motivations of volunteers. Um, and those are the findings that they talk about. So what motivates people to take part in projects but they don't necessarily then ask about the outcomes of volunteers and how they link to the motivations. So in a very basic sense, um, there's a bit of a limitation in certain research um, in the sense that papers don't necessarily look into are the outcomes that volunteers have received from taking part, do they link up to the motivations? So the reasons that people took part, were they actually fulfilled um, in the end? Um, and if not, perhaps this actually is leading to quite misleading research um, findings and discussion points um, in the sense that these outcomes that research talk about might not actually be personally desired. Um, and in that sense, it might actually not be as revealing um, as the research suggests. So we kind of highlighted this as a, a key issue or problematize current um, research for this issue and how, how it needs to be responded to. 
um, mainly because, it, like I mentioned, it could lead to quite misinformed evaluations of participation. And we felt it was really key that um, this issue is responded to. So in our research and then the paper, um, as I'll go on to talk about, we really focus upon the need to look at a wider range of participation issues, not just motivations or outcomes independently, but linking those two together, as well as bringing in other aspects linked to the concerns of volunteers, the experiences of volunteers, and the wider kind of perceptions of what community science is to them, um, and how they feel it can improve going forward to make sure that they themselves, the volunteers, can be seen to contribute in the, the most effective and efficient way possible. Um, so by linking these two together and looking at this wider range of participation issues, we really find that in a, a practical sense, um, it could improve main, main, maintenance strategies. Um, so it could be a, a better way of ensuring the volunteers are more engaged in the long term with projects um, and how the requirements are um, efficiently being responded to. Um, and like I mentioned, making sure that the outcomes that they do achieve were actually linked to the, the motivations that they have in the first place. Um, so yeah, to highlight how their drivers uh, to take part in projects were actually then fulfilled. Um, and then the, a conceptual level as well, this kind of approach also creates a more holistic approach to un understanding um, and examining participation. Um, and how this in the longer term could be useful, not just for the volunteers themselves to continue engaging, um, but also for the, the projects as well to make sure that the volunteers are fully maximizing their potential contribution. So kind of looking at this um, literature review that we carried out um, and then problematizing current research approaches, um, we also highlighted that there's certain issues that need to be responded to and this is what this paper attempted to do. Um, so we then formulated kind of three key research objectives um, to respond to these and then set up the, the research design that we would then follow. Um, so in the first place to, to more critically look into participation, um, first of all, to link motivation to outcomes. Um, so not just look at them in, individually, um, and then, like I mentioned, to bring in these other aspects of participation as well. So to ask volunteers about their perceptions of community science, um, as well as their experiences and their concerns, um, to make sure that we fully understand volunteers in terms of what they want to get out of projects, if this is being fulfilled and what can be done to make sure projects are more responsive to their requirements. Uh, the second objective then looked into how we could create profiles of volunteers. Um, so I'll go on to mention how we use factor analysis. Um, as a means of decoding the information and analyzing the, the surveys that we carried out with volunteers. Um, and then to look into how, by creating these profiles um, and grouping volunteers together, it could then highlight their, how their participation pathways to community science um, and to understand what these pathways are and how they could be expanded as well to make sure that um, there's always a, a strong possibility for all types of volunteers to uh, take part in projects um, and to get the most out of their participation. Um, and the final research objective um, looked into how we can create, in a practical sense, uh, recommendations that could help projects create uh, particip participation processes that, are, that can be more responsive uh, to the volunteers. Um, like I mentioned throughout, how on a, a practical level, this could then lead to projects which can really maximize the, the input and the potential input of volunteers. So taking these research objectives on board, we then designed the research design. Um, and we find it to be most useful because we're looking into a large uh, number of volunteers across a number of different projects. Um, it would be most useful to use a, an online survey. Um, so we created the survey a couple of, a couple of years ago now um, and then sent it out to the volunteers of eight different marine community science projects, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next slide. Um, and how this the survey was sent out to the volunteers um, for about three or four months in total. Um, and then we received the responses from the volunteers of these projects. Um, in terms of the actual questions of the, the, the survey that we sent out, um, we did involve some quite general um, questions on participation. So looking into uh, questions on frequency of participation. So how often did uh, the volunteers take part in projects? Um, looking into the task they carried out. So they asked them, what kind of roles did you play in the project? Um, and would you like to take part in different um, roles going forward as well? Um, and as well to look into their experience um, and their degree of engagement overall. Um, but as well as those kind of general issues, we then looked into the more important aspects that we um, pulled out from the literature review to respond to um, in regards to their perceived motivations and outcomes of uh, participation, um, as well as looking into their general experiences and concerns, um, as well as their percep perceptions of what community science can do differently going forward. Um, and we also involve more novel statements as well, um, looking into transformative issues of community science, um, just kind of idea of community science being or having a, a transformative potential is something that's become increasingly common and talked about in research. Um, so we thought it'd be useful, although it isn't the focus of this research, to at least mention it and to 
to ask volunteers about transformative issues. Um, so we really looked into asking them how taking part in these projects does this lead to different interpretations um, um, of what environmental management should be doing, um, what the limitations of current approaches are, um, or does it lead to changes in their mindset, um, as well as their actions regarding environmental issues. Um, so like I mentioned, we don't necessarily pull out these issues in too much detail, um, but we almost did it as a means of getting a, a beginning step or beginning understanding, initial understanding of um, transformative scope of community science as, as an issue that we want to look into in future research projects as well. Um, so like I mentioned, um, we don't necessarily just look into participation um, through the, the lens of traditional approaches by looking at the motivations or outcomes, but really pull all these key participation issues together um, to looking at everything from motivations to outcomes, not just understanding are these outcomes that you achieve by taking part in projects, but were these outcomes actually desired by you in the first place? Um, and do these link to your motivations? And like I mentioned as well, then looking into the perceptions and the rules of engagement um, and general kind of experiences and concerns of volunteers. So like I mentioned, um, we looked into a number of different projects, um, so eight in total um, across the UK and Ireland. Um, and the majority of these were coordinated and led by NGO organisations. Um, a number of these were funded by government projects, um, but led by NGOs, and then we had a couple of um, more collaborative or co-produced projects that were really community-led initiatives. Um, but it wasn't necessarily funding from government or council bodies, but rather it was just a community um, initiative where they really took the lead in the, um, the project. So I won't go into too much detail on the individual projects. There's more information in the paper, of course, but I'm sure some of the organisations will uh, be familiar to a lot of you. Um, from large NGO, um, large NGOs like RSPB to also Wildlife and Irish Will and Dolphin Group, um, to the more community kind of level projects. So like I mentioned, one of the co-produced initiatives we looked into, which is a beach care group um, in the, the coastline of Northern Ireland, we looked into as well. Um, so we sent the, the survey out to volunteers of these eight projects. Um, and in total, it was sent to 737 participants, um, and we received 308 um, responses, which gave us a response rate of 41.7%. So it was seen as a, um, a good return in terms of the number of um, participants that it was sent out to. Um, it certainly gave us enough, enough, enough information to analyze the data in a bit more detail. So we really um, used factor analysis as a key means of analysis. We did use some descriptive um, and thematic analysis um, to, to look into examining some of the, the data feedback in the surveys, um, but we really focus upon the use of factor analysis um, as a means of creating these profiles and um, profiles of volunteers, um, which I mentioned earlier, we thought would be a useful way of understanding in a bit more detail um, pathways to participation. Um, so if you're not familiar with what exploratory factor analysis is, um, it's a multivariate approach to, to data analysis. Um, um, which allows um, research or analysis processes to, to look at variable relationships, um, so to link a number of different aspects that were common um, within the survey responses to link these together um, to make sure there's quite a, a comprehensive and um, holistic approach to analyzing the data. Um, so key means of using it, um, factor analysis that is, as I mentioned, was linked to our idea of looking into how we can group profiles of volunteers to, to group different volunteers together, and then to think about what this tells us about participation. Um, so it was really linked to un uncovering um, patterns of engagement um, and these kind of links between different volunteers. Um, and the key kind of benefit of using factor analysis was that, is that it accounts for this motivational outcome nexus that we've um, created. Um, and as I mentioned, this link between the two different aspects um, and that highlights how this isn't just a, an ad attitudinal issue um, and how participation goes well beyond this um, and links to issues including expectations, behavior experiences and concerns um, and how these need to be unpacked in a bit more detail. Um, and factor analysis really provide a useful means to, to achieve this. Um, and additionally to this as well, factor analysis um, gives the opportunity to kind of critically um, look into these quite complex and overlapping issues um, of a whole range of different variables that the survey um, highlighted and volunteers responded to. Um, and how we don't necessarily just focus upon a number of individual variables, but like I said, we can link these together um, to create a better understanding of participation. And I won't bore you too much with the actual process of, of carrying out factor analysis, but um, this is kind of the process that we followed. So initially you 
use factor analysis to reduce the different um, or the whole range of variables that the survey highlights. So really the variables, I'm talking about these are statements that we put in the survey. So um, particular statements on what motivates um, volunteers um, and the same kind of um, statement, but then we calibrate it to look at how it links to the outcomes of volunteers. Um, so these variables, um, we limit them until we could get a more concise and comprehensive um, number of dimensions um, from the survey data. So this was done by eliminating the data that had the least um, or the lowest levels of, of explanatory power. Um, and then we, we finally got to a list of 12 different survey variables um, or statements um, that we felt were most um, conceptually interesting um, and highlighted how there's a, a key kind of um, link between certain types of volunteers um, and how they're looking into using factor analysis on these 12 survey statements that covered everything from motivations to outcomes concerns and experiences um, really highlighted how there's definite trends um, within participation um, of certain volunteers. Um, and I'll talk about more in detail in the next slide, um, but this process was done so we could create um, different and construct different profiles of volunteers um, that were conceptually similar um, and linked in terms of specific aspects of their participation. Um, so in total, we pulled out four different profiles of volunteers um, and these profiles don't necessarily account for everyone in the survey responses. Um, they account for 60% of the volunteers who took part in the, the surveys. Um, and this is pretty standard for factor analysis. Um, it's very unusual that it would go above 70% of survey data um, because obviously not all volunteers are going to align with their own motivations or outcomes. Um, there's going to be a number of volunteers who are, are very different um, in their specific interests of community science. So using factor analysis, um, like I mentioned, we got to 6% of the volunteers covered by these four profiles, which was standard with methodological um, requirements. Um, and also how they're key profiles, um, but they don't necessarily account for everybody. Uh, so it's an important fact to remember that these are only profiles that we took out of this survey analysis. Uh, it's not to say that these are the only types of uh, profiles that take part in community science projects, um, but these are the four key profiles that we pulled out. Um, as I mentioned at the end, we certainly don't suggest that any one type of profile <clears throat> excuse me, should be prioritized, um, but rather the projects should really just understand that there's a, a different range of pathways to participation um, and how they should perhaps broaden their approach to understanding these. Um, so yeah, we don't say one type of volunteer is better, but rather that projects should be aware that there are different types of participants um, and they should spend more time and effort in looking into what these are and what they represent. So the four profiles that we did pull out um, were defined and, and termed by ourselves. Um, as activists, conservationists, professionals, and hobbyists. Um, so the activists were the most uh, commonly spread uh, profiles. So this accounted for about 30% of the volunteers who took part in the surveys. Um, and these are volunteers that are really linked to motivations and outcomes and experiences that look at how they can use community science and take part in projects um, as a means of challenging environmental injustice um, and inequality. So they really view certain our community science projects um, as a means of giving action to their ideas of how envir environmental governance and marine governance issues need to res be responded to, um, and particularly issues of justice that they view uh, should be challenged and changed. Um, they interpret community science as a means of trying to challenge this. Um, so in terms of motivation, it's very altruistic in the sense that it's not necessarily a personal desire to take part in these projects, but rather a similar outward looking uh, motivation. Um, how taking part in their in projects can actually lead to beneficial outcomes for the wider realm of marine governance. Um, and there's real focus in their desired, outcome, desired outcomes um, of giving power to local knowledge, so how they can <clears throat> transfer local knowledge to the level where it can make a difference. Um, and in this sense, lead to a challenge um, of current interpretations of uh, marine governance issues, marine conservation issues, um, and how local knowledge can be involved in the process of leading to policy changes, um, making sure policy processes are more responsive um, to the needs of local people. The second profile, or second most common profile was conservationists. Um, and these are a slightly different type of volunteer in the sense their their interests and the motivations are more linked to uh, collectivism. Um, so that they want to take part in projects where they can engage with uh, like-minded individuals um, who have been involved with environmental processes or projects for a long time. Um, and how they, in terms of output, their key focus is upon contributing towards ecological studies or reports um, and feeding into current kind of management processes. So it's not necessarily <clears throat> an attempt to challenge processes, 
rather feed into the, the current approaches that are there um, and how they view this as a, a useful means um, of their participation in community science. Um, so like I mentioned, they have a key desire to take part with similar-minded and like-minded individuals um, and how they view this as a social outcome such as taking part or engaging with others as a key outcome of community science. Then pulled out a third profile, which links to, uh, we turned as professionals, and this links to volunteers who really um, can be split into two different types. Um, so in the first sense, uh, retired um, retired individuals who once worked in the environmental sector. Um, so how they see community science as a means of extending their, their principles and their interests from their career um, post-retirement. Um, and the other um, type of professional uh, profile could be understood as uh, younger generation um, volunteers view taking part in community science projects as a useful means of gaining experience um, that can support their future career as well. So how it could be a useful means of getting into um, gaining experience that can get them into the environmental sector. Um, like I mentioned, this really links to a lot of, in terms of motivations, links to principalism. Um, so how their, their environmental principles, um, be they retired individuals or, or, um, or their career individuals as well, how their principles, um, the link to the environment, how that really motivates their participation. Um, and the final <clears throat> profile that we pulled out is hobbyists. So these are individuals that really take part in community science as a means of extending their hobby. So whether the hobby be angling or photography or bird watching, um, maybe community science is a useful means of extending their, their participation in these, these hobbies, um, and give them a bit more of a structure and an output to their hobbies as well. So taking part in projects uh, gives them the opportunity to actually contribute their insight to either scientific management processes, um, or potentially policy as well, um, and how this really gains a level of satisfaction for hobbyists so they can get this higher level of output um, from the individual hobbies that they take part in. Like I said, those are the four profiles that we pulled out of the analysis, but they don't necessarily account for all volunteers who are engaged with the projects. Um, and we certainly don't suggest that uh, these are the only types of people <clears throat> who take part in projects either. Um, but we do view it as a useful, useful means of understanding a little bit more detail about who takes part in these projects, what it is that encourages them to take part and motivates them. Um, and most importantly, we can then learn from this um, so we can understand a bit more of what the barriers or what the opportunities are um, to making sure the volunteers can maximize their contribution, to really learn from that, um, to make sure that participation processes can become more responsive um, to volunteers. Um, so taking, in, taking on board those barriers and opportunities and, and learning from them. A few more issues I'll pull out from the findings of the analysis. Um, so breaking down the four profiles in terms of the participation in different types of projects. Um, like I mentioned at the start, there's kind of three key different types of community science projects from contributory, collaborative, right up to the co-produce level. Um, what we find is that activists, although they are most common in the collaborative level, um, much higher percent of activists than any other profiles took part in co-produce projects, um, which isn't necessarily surprising because as I mentioned, activists linked to uh, being motivated to really challenge current governance processes. So taking part in co-produce projects where they have more uh, scope to really not just collect data, but also analyze and disseminate um, and structure the, the design of projects as well. Um, these were the projects that a large number of volunteers, uh, activist volunteers were keenly engaged with. We find that the, the conservationists and professionals were much more linked to collaborative projects. So this is a pro these are the projects where there's a good balance between um, or a good relationship and, and link between the volunteers themselves and the, the coordinators and managers of projects. Um, so conservationists and professionals were most common in these projects. And the hobbyists were by and large most common in the contributory level projects. So projects where they only really take part in data collection. And again, this is, isn't necessarily uh, surprising. Um, as I mentioned on the last slide, hobbyists really taking part in projects as they see it as a useful means of extending their participation and their interest in their hobbies. Um, and as such, in terms of the tasks they take part in, um, they don't necessarily step beyond the, the data collection level. Um, it's really just take, taking their hobbies to the in a more structured environment in projects, um, but they don't necessarily then take part in analysis or project design tasks as well. Um, they really maintain their level of engagement at the contributory level. And in terms of the interpretations of the different types of um, profiles, we find that activists um, really interpret and, and perceive community science as a means of producing knowledge. Um, so the, these, this question in the survey was on what the volunteers think community science can, or how do, um, volunteers think community science can be more effective um, and what is its most um, important potential output 
um, for marine conservation and activists really focus upon producing knowledge. So again, some of these uh, outcomes aren't necessarily surprising um, once we look at the profiles of volunteers. And for the activists, it's pretty clear that producing knowledge is one of the key aspects of how policy can be changed. So um, that's what they perceive as community science in terms of being its most useful um, and most beneficial output for conservation and professionals. Uh, they talk about how educating volunteers um, is the most important outcome of community science and the most um, valuable aspect of projects. Um, so taking part in the projects can educate the volunteers themselves and how this can then lead to changes in their individual uh, behavior and actions. Um, and hobbyists um, mainly focused on the highest percentage um, within this profile looked at how um, community science in terms of being most effective and efficient um, is a means of producing knowledge. Um, but there's also a really high percentage of volunteers that mention other aspects of um, participation that they view most important. Um, and I highlight this number because it, it certainly wasn't the case with other profiles. Um, and when looking at the respond responses of volunteers and what um, they expand upon as the other issues, a lot of them, a lot of them were very individually focused, um, or egotistic, you could say, um, and really focused upon how they view community science as a useful means of getting um, involved with environmental issues of um, expanding their hobbies, um, becoming more active. And they don't necessarily view community science as being um, an active means of, of instigating change to the status quo, um, but rather a useful means of extending their interests. Um, so it's useful to look at that and those differences, um, how it really is key differences between the different profiles um, in terms of their participation and the tasks they take part in, the um, engagement with different types of projects, um, and then again, the perceptions of what they view community science as being. Um, what is most useful outputs can be. So kind of analyzing all these findings and putting it into a discussion, the, the information that we pulled out and the motivations weren't necessarily different um, from current re research and it largely reflected what current literature says um, on the motivations of volunteers. What we, what we pulled out in the wider aspects of participation, so linking motivations to outcomes and, and looking at aspects of experience um, and concerns, by this revealed a lot more valuable insight. Um, and we really feel the profiles are, are useful insight to participation to current literature um, and how this can be useful for practical community science aspects as well. Um, so creating these profiles really helps to shed light on the, the factors and the issues that can support or inhibit participation. Um, so like I mentioned, by decoding different um, responses of volunteers, you, we can start to learn a bit more about um, how they could um, enhance their participation, what kind of conditions do they require to be able to to go to the next level of um, tasks that they take part in um, and what would lead to making sure that they retain their engagement with projects um, and, and support a greater outcome from the projects themselves in the longer term. Um, and like I mentioned, we also find quite interesting aspects um, of different interpretations of volunteers in terms of what they think community science can do in terms of its value and role going forward for marine conservation. Um, and again, we really pulled out this idea that there's a number of different pathways to participation and how general engagement in community science is very multi-dimensional. Um, it's really important to look into all these, um, the vast array of different aspects that underpin um, engagement and participation, um, and how they highlight how there is a wide scope of pathways to projects, um, and how we only pulled out four profiles, but um, in no way are we suggesting that these are the only pathways that exist, um, but rather that we're highlighting how there are a number of different um, pathways, so it's important to look into these in future research as well. We also pulled out quite interesting information on the nature of knowledge and nature of science that volunteers engage with. Um, so in questions and responses by volunteers, it's quite clear that professionals and the hobbyists, two of the profiles we pulled out. Um, for them, the primary issue of, of taking part in projects isn't, isn't necessarily the depth of research itself. Um, it's more about just taking part in projects and um, for sure the, the information that they can contribute can be useful and, and that can satisfy them. Um, but it's more of a national engagement um, in projects themselves. But for activists and conservationists, the, the nature of research and of knowledge is much more important. Um, so their interest in science really goes beyond this kind of technical level um, to a bit more of an epistemological basis um, and how the knowledge that they're producing is actually used, so what it contributes to. Um, so the, for the conservationists, it's really linked to outcome knowledge. Um, so this was knowledge that um, has an impairment uh, empirical value um, and can contribute useful information on environmental uh, conditions and monitoring reports and, and uh, recordings as well on marine conservation issues that could be used in scientific reports and can be used to 
to influence policy decisions and contribute to policy decisions, um, as well as reports put out by the projects themselves. And then for the, the activists, uh, kind of unsurprisingly, I'd like to understanding of knowledge which is actionable. Um, so this is knowledge that connects heterogeneous elements. So not just scientific aspects, but also socio-political issues and economical issues and political issues as well. Um, and how that knowledge that they create can actually inform and instigate action. Um, so it's quite useful to understand how knowledge can be interpreted very differently by the volunteers. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the prof professionals and hobbyists don't necessarily step beyond the idea of community science just being a research approach. Um, um, in terms of the knowledge it produces. But then for the conservationists, um, it's more about the outcome of the knowledge. And for the action, action, activists, sorry, it's more about the actionability of the knowledge. So how this can actually lead to and then to get change in the longer term. So to conclude, um, it's really clear that there's a fine line between supporting and taking advantage of volunteers. Um, and it's really important to look into this in detail to make sure there isn't a chance that volunteers are going to lose their uh, participation or their potential contribution. Um, and to make sure that um, projects can be very responsive to their volunteers. Um, it's, it's pretty clear, and we had it in the paper, that community science has really strong potential to effectively respond and contribute to the, the problems currently facing marine governance processes, um, particularly in regards to the rationalization of knowledge and participation issues as well. Um, but to actually achieve this uh, potential, it's really clear and, and key that uh, projects have a strong um, ability to be um, to uh, responses to the volunteers and facilitate participation processes that really actively engage volunteers um, and make sure that their, their, their concerns are heard and listened to and factored into future projects as well. Um, and like I mentioned to our, we're really not suggesting that one type of volunteer is better than any other, um, but rather that there's a wide range of different pathways to participation. Um, and it's really key that um, this is looked into and it's the nature of participation that should become clear or should become key uh, within future research on community science um, participation. So just quickly, I'll, I'll wrap up by mentioning some of the, the research impact um, that we've had from this paper, and then uh, a couple of ideas about future research that we want to look into. Um, so in kind of a sc scholarly level, um, what we think we've done with this paper is to illustrate how it's important to look at um, motivations and outcomes and concerns and experiences um, simultaneously. So to look at these aspects, uh, of participation together um, and how this can help to uncover pathways to participation um, and how these can be really useful to look at um, what the opportunities and, and barriers to participation are for certain volunteers, um, how these can be responded to. Um, and like I just mentioned in the last couple of slides there, um, pretty interesting information as well from, from a conceptual background um, on the nature of knowledge that volunteers are interested in um, and how this can be really useful going forward to understand um, what it is that volunteers want to get out um, from their participation, um, from a knowledge background, um, and how maybe tasks can be tailored to, to suit this as well um, in projects themselves. And then in a practical sense, um, as well as the publication, we created finding reports, um, which highlight the responses of individuals from each of the individual projects we looked into. Um, these finding reports were then sent back to the individual projects. Um, so they were able to get a, um, information on their volunteers, what motivates them, and what their desired outcomes are, and what concerns they have about their experience in their projects. Um, and we got really good feedback from the projects and how useful this was and why they'd used this to um, inform their, their upcoming projects as well. Um, so in a practical sense, it was very useful to create these feedback um, reports um, that had recommendations on how the individual projects um, might be able to be more responsive to their volunteers going forward. Um, and in terms of future research that we, uh, myself and perhaps my supervisors as well, want to look into in the future, um, at the moment we're finishing up a paper um, which looks into the, the politics of community science. So a little bit different to what I talked about today. Rather than focusing on participatory issues, it looks more into the organizational level of projects. Um, sort of really understand um, how projects are shaped and the forces and the relations of power that, um, that guide the direction and involvement of projects. Um, and to really analyze these in a bit more detail. So as part of my PhD, I carried out um, a round of interviews with a whole range of different types of community science actors, uh, from those involved with the coordination of projects and the management of projects, uh, to those in policy as well, so policymakers um, and government departments, to understand their perspectives um, and interpretations of community science, um, and to really highlight how there's these balances of power within projects um, that really need to be looked into to fully understand 
our project could be changed going forward. Um, we really look into this as we're interested in this transformative potential, as I mentioned earlier, um, with community science. So we're trying to understand how it can be more transformative in the outcomes that it um, creates and um, how to fully understand that we need to look into the, the power dimensions and, and dynamics that operate within projects. Um, so I won't mention too much detail because obviously um, this paper isn't totally finished yet or submitted. Um, but what we've pulled out in an in a analytical sense is that although um, funding from government departments to NGOs to, to run projects and coordinate them may appear as a transfer of power, um, in reality from analyzing the data and the responses of interviewees, um, it can really be seen as a, a means of turning projects into objects or subjects um, of the state of the policymakers themselves. So um, we look into how there's kind of three key means um, that we've noticed from the funders of projects uh, to make sure the projects can develop in um, particular, main, particular avenues um, and how regulations can be used um, and standardized practices as well that can really regulate how volunteers are used and what knowledge the projects create and produce. Um, and how they just in general, this kind of highlights the politics of community science, which isn't necessarily highlighted in current research. Um, how we feel this is a really key aspect going forward that should be looked into um, the more community science grows in, in the future. Um, and we also have an idea of creating that I think piece or discussion type paper as well, which kind of reflects upon these issues and focuses on the transform potential of projects. Um, and how in general, we, we kind of suggest how uh, community science, if it wants to be fully transformative, might have to be more power aware and more critically conscious um, going forward. So that's everything I want to talk about today in terms of the publication. Um, I'll leave a couple of references there at the end um, that are used. Um, and if you have any questions, obviously I'm more than happy to answer them. And, Look forward to a discussion as well. So thanks very much. Thanks so much, Ben. That was a very in-depth kind of overview of that paper and touched on a number of different really important topics. And I think you know that that understanding of what motivates people to get involved so that you can retain that that effort and that capacity as well as building the engagement and the ocean literacy that you mentioned and really understanding how we can bring people more and more into these conversations and into these actions and um, particularly as we think about the goals of the ocean decade the sustainable development goals all those sorts of things that are driving so many political decision making decisions being made and um, bringing people and citizens and communities into those conversations is really important and um, there are lots of uh, there's a few questions in the q a box and um, you answered one of mine just at the very end so my, one of my questions was going to be whether you had done interviews or spoken to people about the kind of the perceptions of community science because that's always a, a challenge and i think something that came up defra did a, a recent review of um they call it citizen science but the same kind of idea um I, I did an evidence statement last year which i think is being published quite soon um and that kind of um conversation and the quality of data collected in that way and the, the reputation of that of citizen science community science type data i just wondered if you'd explored that in any detail it sounds like that's what's going to come out a little bit more in your next paper which is exciting so really looking forward to seeing that um, we're we've only got a couple more minutes before two o'clock so i'm going to move on to questions and um, hopefully people can stick around for a little bit after um two and um, but if not it's all being recorded so that you'll get the q a session on the recording if you have to leave um, but I'm going to go to a question from um, Maria, who was asking whether or not you had gender dis disaggregated data for the profiles that you'd created. Um, and for example, are there any, were any profiles more um, male or female dominated or was there gender balance that you found? Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, and yeah, it's a really important aspect, actually. Um, we didn't find too much um, of a stark difference in the gender um, of each of the profiles. Um, which is in some ways unusual because a lot of the literature on um, participatory research um, on citizen science, community science highlights how there is a real balance in terms of gender and particularly imbalance in terms of people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, but in this research, we didn't find too much of a, a difference. There was a, a more of a dominance, dominance of males in general in the projects, um, but not necessarily in the, the gender. Um, and in the profiles, there wasn't too many drastic differences in terms of the balance between uh, females and males in the activist pro profile or, the, or conservationists, hobbyists or professionals, it was all quite um, level. I think we mentioned, in the, we do have a table in the paper which highlights that. Um, but yeah, we didn't pull out anything too drastic. We kind of expected that we would actually um, because of the other literature on that, but maybe it's just the projects we looked into. Um, but yeah, certainly going forward, I think research should always focus on 
uh, really pulling out aspects in regards to who these people are, so their gender, their their backgrounds, um, even nationality, all those kind of things to make sure that we're just kind of increasing the future for more inclusive um, participation projects um, that can be responsive to gender issues or socioeconomic issues as well. But yeah, thanks for your question. That's great, thank you. That's really unusual. You're right that, that you would expect to see that in the data and it's interesting that you didn't find that and you're right it could be because of the, the projects that you were looking at. It's really fascinating and I really appreciate the call for more standardized analysis of those kinds of variables in social science research. It's something that um, we I've worked with a colleague recently on a review paper and we were looking at um, the different you know what what people measure what they assess in terms of people's perceptions around marine issues and so many papers don't report findings on gender or age group or they, they collect it and they create a, a respondent profile but they don't actually go well what does that mean in terms of the people who are answering these questions and you know, the perceptions that they're holding so I think that's a great call for it to, to, to action on that I really appreciate that um I've got another question um from uh, Maureen Severin, who said, was, and this is another question I'd written down actually, was, did you explore an outcome of well-being from participation in the community science programmes? Was that measured in any way? Um, I'd say it's probably a limitation of the research that we didn't look into well-being, unfortunately. Um, we looked into aspects of um, satisfaction. Um, so was there participation, like I mentioned, that there were there original motivations that they, were they fulfilled? Um, so in that sense, we looked into satisfaction, but I guess in terms of well-being, that was an issue that we didn't look into. Um, but yeah, I can see how that would be a really important aspect to look into. So something I'll think about in the future. And just thinking about that, actually, um, the mark come from someone had a question last week for me saying about, did we look into dissatisfaction? So was there any aspects or questions that we posed on uh, what were the key aspects of dissatisfaction that the volunteers had? And again, that was something we didn't look into, but maybe okay. it should be in the future because it could be useful learning lessons to understand again how those could be responded to. Um, and certainly aspect of well-being, again, that would be a really useful means in a practical sense for the projects to, to factor in. Yeah, and absolutely. How the volunteers can be best supported, um, or their needs can be responded to as well. So it wasn't something we looked into, but yeah, um, so thanks for the suggestion because it's something we'll look into in the future. Yeah, it's, I think it's, an, it's one of those things that's coming out more and more is, you know, the, it's particularly after the last year is the, the reason, it's part of the reason why people might want to get out and be involved in these volunteer programmes is because actually they want the well-being benefits of being by the coast or around mm -hmm. nature or in the water or whatever it might be. And then um, we had a student work with the Seven Estuary Partnership a couple of years ago who looked at the well-being benefits of being involved in beach cleans. Um, and did find that there were, I mean, it was a fairly small undergrad project, but there was a, a relationship and it is something I think that we need to be quite conscious of when we think about that, because that could be part of the motivating factors. So yeah, it'd be really interesting to see if you guys go on to look at that any further. And again, that point about dissatisfaction, I think that that really um, speaks to the, the point you made around um, people's motivations and the outcomes matching up. And what happens if they don't match up? It could mean that they're, excited by different things or it could mean that they go oh actually that's not what I thought it was going to be so I'm not going to do it anymore and it could put people off so I think it's a really it's really interesting to to think about that we've probably not been um great at thinking you know we probably focus more on the ecological monitoring rather than the monitoring of the people doing the work historically so I think um a really fascinating point to be great to see that um a couple more questions if you've got time I'm going to just um, there's a question from Daryl who said, um, thank you very much Ben, there's an increasing number of citizen community science projects being developed which is great, however do you think there's scope for more projects or do you think we're getting close to reaching capacity in terms of availability of volunteers or risk of volunteer fatigue and um, being an issue? Yeah, uh, thanks a lot Daryl, um, and really great question actually. Um, because not in this paper, but as, as mentioned at the end, there are a couple of upcoming papers. Those are kind of issues that we did, did look into. Um, so trying to understand what the future of community science could be. Um, so a really important point to highlight um, is volunteer fatigue. So how long can projects expect their volunteers to still be keen and motivated to take part in projects, um, especially if the project itself isn't really changing or developing over time. So if the task is maintained the same, uh, is that really going to be encouraging enough for volunteers to take part? So 
from the end degrees that we pulled out some interesting facts on that um, from the coordinators, so how they can, how they're trying to, to change the development of projects to make sure it can be responsive and more engaging and the task, task can be changed over time. And a real focus on that was to ensure the volunteers can work their way up the participation level as they talked about, so how they can move on from the contributory level to make, take part in different tasks. Um, and how over time, maybe their overall aim could be to, to engage with the design of projects as well. Um, so in a practical sense, those, those are some of the solutions that board coordinators put forward to um, ensure volunteers are, are still engaged and interested going forward. Um, but then in terms of your other question on uh, just in general, the future of community science and are these projects sustainable and are they gonna run to an end at some point? We pulled out some really interesting aspects um, from the coordinators projects you mentioned that they, they think they need to look into more ideas of networks of projects, um, look into alternative funding streams and these more innovative approaches um, because yeah, they, they find a lot of constraints with current approaches um, and kind of barriers to truly really operating in the way that they want to. Again, I guess that links to these kind of power dynamics and uneven balances of power that funders kind of uh, implement upon them. Um, but yeah, they have solutions and ideas of how they can come on become more innovative and certainly um, using networks of, of projects where they can work together with different NGOs um, to make sure they're not necessarily collecting the same type of data and looking into the same projects. So projects can be uh, very different. Um, so there's no overlap of, of projects, I guess. Um, and in that sense, how they could be a, a good platform for transfer of volunteers from different initiatives. Um, and even administratively wise, it'd be easy to do so. Um, and yet yeah, to, to kind of challenge that kind of idea that Funding is quite a short-term focus most of the time. So a lot of the projects only get maybe three to five years of funding. Um, and how that can be a real barrier to the, the long-term um, uh, objectives or aims of projects. Um, and certainly that links to the, the future of community science. So looking into how that can be challenged as well could be, or certainly will be a key issue going forward. Uh, but yeah, it's important to, to question that. And we certainly will put that in the upcoming paper in more detail. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Ben. So an exciting further paper to come. And I think that um, that short term funding issue is something any of us working in research have experienced yeah. the challenge of. It is really tricky. I love the idea of the networks of projects so that they kind of transfer. So if people yeah. wanted to stay doing the same thing, they could. But if they wanted to transfer and like rotate around projects so that you continue the capacity to keep people interested, I think that's a great idea. That sounds brilliant. And um, this question from Pam Buchan, who said, um, when you were talking about your typologies, the, the profiles of people that you'd identified, it is interesting to see the prevalence of activists and the idea that citizen science is seen as an act of citizenship in, in what you could say is marine citizens. And she said that she'd found that in her work, the marine citizen could take, would often take at least two of, of these different profiles, sometimes more. How delineated did you find your groupings to be? And was there a crossover within individuals across a couple of profiles? And I guess, how did you deal with that? Yeah, great question. Thanks a lot, Pam. Um, and yeah, for sure, there's a lot of uh, conceptual linkages between the different profiles. Um, so it really just came down to factor analysis and the process that it um, kind of instigates um, that we had to make um, kind of decisions on what volunteers link up to certain profiles. Um, but certainly there's a lot of aspects of the activists, for instance, that linked up um, to the conservation profile as well. Um, but just in a conceptual sense, uh, the responses to certain questions and the variables that um, factor analysis pulled out um, to find them as being activists. But yeah, for sure, a lot of the volunteers, if we were to ask you say to them, would you identify as any of these profiles? Probably wouldn't uh, do so. Uh, it's more just from an analytical sense, that's what they were find as. Um, but I think we maybe should pull that out, out a bit more, should have pulled out a bit more in the paper, and maybe I did okay, but um, that these are just examples of, of groups of volunteers that do exist um, that the data pulled out. Um, but in no way is this suggesting that these are the only types of volunteers or that you have to fit within these profiles. Because um, for sure, and like you mentioned in your research, um, a lot of marine um, communities and individuals, um, individual citizens might link up with a, different, a whole range of different types of profiles. Um, and their interests can be very multi-diverse. So yeah, for sure. Um, a lot of the volunteers did link up to different profiles. It was just the analytical approach led us to defining these four individual types. Um, but yeah, a lot of them link up to number of the profiles here. Thanks. Also, I should just say oh, as well, I'm sorry. Um, some of them obviously don't link up to any profile. Um, oh, so okay. factor analysis pulled out those four profiles accounting for 60% of the volunteers. Um, oh, okay. So there's 40% of those um, response, respondents in the survey that actually didn't link up on a conceptual level to any of the profiles. Um, 
you know, we certainly had aspects of one or two of the profiles, but didn't have enough um, analytical score um, mm -hmm. to link to the profile. So, but again, that's just the limitations of using research approaches like that, I guess. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It'd be really interesting to go back and ask those people, like, what do you identify as and see if they do, if they did match up, you know, and see like if, if that's it, because yeah, often it kind of doesn't always work in that way. Um, thank you very much. Great question, Pam. And then I've got one more question and then we'll, we'll close up. Um, it's a question from someone who's not put their name, but they've said, did you account for the fact that organisations often charge for involvement in citizen or community science projects and how that can be a barrier um, in terms of how people can access um, those sorts of projects and those sorts of opportunities? Uh, we didn't, unfortunately. Um, but that's a really good question because, yeah, again, that's a really good example of a bar that can exist to prevent preventing people taking part in projects. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't look into that. Um, but that could have revealed some really interesting information because um, perhaps some activists would have been put off taking part in a project which you have to pay for because um, perhaps they wouldn't have the, like you mentioned, the financial backing to do so. But they might link to a project where they, they can't afford to take part in, but they don't. That project might not link up to their interests and their ideas of actually leading to change and policy and so on. So there might be types of volunteers that want to take part, part in projects and they sit their ideas and interpretations, but can't do so. So yeah, great question. Unfortunately, we didn't look into it. Um, but I think in the future, when we, we try and encourage this more critical analysis of community science, that's a really good point of something that we could look into. Um, and again, just pulling out the, the barriers to participation, um, and what the opportunities are as well to make sure they can be um, transformed into learning lessons going forward. So thank you. Some great ideas then for putting into your future future research and recommendations into your, your PhD, which is really good. And um, hopefully there's some you know, good good viva questions in there. <laughs> some, some practice run. Um, thank you so much. There's a comment in the chat box from Pam um, who's linked you to her PhD work, just in case you haven't spotted it. I think it'd be useful for you to, to look at that. And um, if you've any issues, I can put you guys in touch anyway. Um, but that was great, Ben. Thank you so much um, for talking through that, that paper and the work you've been do doing. It's really, really fascinating stuff and, and so much more that we, we still need to do to understand those communities of people that are working in community science and the role they have, the really important role they have in contributing to our data collection, to in, encouraging ocean literacy, to our governance processes. Um, and I said during the, the Mari session a couple of weeks ago or last week, it feels like a long time ago, um, you know, the, the, if we're to deliver this transformational relationship between society and the ocean and all those big kind of broad aspirations that are being set out for us at the moment, giving people opportunity and the access to getting engaged in whatever way fits them is really important. And community and citizen science projects have a real role to play in that, I think. So it's been fascinating to, to hear the insights that your PhD is bringing to that. Um, so thank you so much for giving us that talk and everybody thank you for great questions um, I know we went a little bit over but I think there were some really fabulous questions asked at the end so thank you very much for your time this afternoon and um, Ben good luck with finishing the last few bits of your PhD and um, with your Viva um, and um, everybody else there's a next Mars Oxide webinar on the 21st of July with Lou Estevez and um, I'll post details about it um, after today's talk finishes um, you'll also be able to see information in the last Mars Oxide newsletter. Um, but um, hopefully some of you will be able to join us then. And um, yeah, everybody stay well. If we don't see you, I hope you have lovely plans coming up for the summer. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks again, Ben. Nice to see you. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye.